Yes, eh, da skal jeg ta og ønske alle hjertelig velkommen til dette webinaret som skal da handle om University of Glasgow. Eh, vi skal eh, ha en eh, liten session for dere i dag hvor vi bare noen få minutter skal se litt på hva eh, vi i Study Arts of Norway kan hjelpe dere med eh, og hvem vi er. Så skal vi få en liten presentasjon av University of Glasgow av Mark Stasfield som jobber med opptak på eh, Glasgow. Og så tar vi en liten Q&A eh, til slutt. Så hvis det er noen som har eh, spørsmål, så er det bare å skrive de ned i chatten, og så tar vi spørsmålene til slutt. Um, så har jeg også supert hvis alle kan uh, også skrive i chatten om de har uh, uh, om de ønsker å studere en bachelorgrad eller en mastergrad og gjerne også hvilken grad de har sett på hvis de har sett på en spesifikk grad så det er uh, supert um, så da går vi rett og slett rett på sak, og vi skal snakke bitte litt om Tinder. Fordi Sonor er på en måte som Tinder. Bare at vi ikke er helt, kanskje akkurat helt nøyaktig det samme allikevel. Så i stedet for å matche folk romantisk, som man kan si, så matcher vi da folk akademisk med det universitetet som passer hver enkelt best mulig. Så vi bruker litt tid da, på å bli kjent med dere som søkere, da gjennom den studieveiledningen som vi tilbyr, og på den måten så tror vi at vi kan finne et alternativ som passer dere best mulig. Eh, og kanskje er det University of Glasgow som er det som passer dere best. Eh, vi har også en ordning hvor vi jobber litt også som en arbeidsgiver, eh, arbeidstakerorganisasjon, som for eksempel LO. Det vil si at vi representerer de studentene som vi sender til utlandet og sørger for at de rettighetene som dere har som studenter blir ivaretatt. Både overfor det universitetet som dere starter å studere på, men også i forhold til visum, lånekassa og, og generelt de rettighetene man har som norsk utenlandsstudent. Så på en eller annen, skal jeg si, kanskje litt sånn finurlig, jo, og så på, jobber vi også opp politisk, sånn for eksempel opp mot lånekassa, for å sørge for at utenlandsstudentene har så gode rammebetingelser som mulig for oss å studere i utlandet. Så på en eller annen finurlig måte, som kanskje ikke er kanskje helt sånn matematisk korrekt, men jeg vil si at Sonor er da på en måte det beste fra Tinder og fra arbeidstakerorganisasjonene. Og hva er det vi gjør da? Jo, som sagt så hjelper vi da dere med å finne ut av hvor og hva dere skal studere ut fra de ønskene og forutsetningene som dere har. Vi hjelper dere med å søke på universitetet, og det er kanskje liksom der hovedhjelpen vår er da. For vi har jo lang fartstid og vet veldig godt hvordan man skal søke til disse ulike universitetene. Så når dere søker gjennom oss, så får dere maksimert potensialet for å få opptak på det universitetet som dere er interessert i å studere på. Ved at vi da finner gode alternativer for dere, gode alternativer for dere og at vi luker ut potensielle feil i søknaden som gjør at dere slipper å få avslag på grunn av en formalitet. Så hjelper vi også til med å søke og svare på spørsmål om ting som lånekassa, visum, språktester hvis dere trenger det, men har dere fire eller bedre i engelsk fra VG1, så slipper dere som regel å ta en ekstra språktest. Så vet dere det. Vi kan også hjelpe til med reise, studie og forberedelse, registrering av fag, og så er det også sånn at vi setter dere i kontakt med andre studenter som skal til det samme universitetet som dere skal til, som også har søkt gjennom Sonor. På den måten så er det sånn at dere da kan ta kontakt med hverandre og kanskje planlegge å treffes før dere reiser til for eksempel Glasgow, eller at dere planlegger å treffes når dere kommer fram, og da kan det være litt sånn trygghet i at man ikke reiser alene da. 
Og så er det sånn at all den hjelpen og veiledningen som vi i Sonne gir, den er helt gratis og uforpliktende for dere som studenter. Så hvis dere ikke allerede er i kontakt med oss i Sonne, så vil jeg anbefale at dere tar kontakt med oss. Og det her er jo da de som jobber som veiledere i Sonor, det er vi som er Team Sonor, og vi har alle sammen erfaring med å være utenlandsstudenter. Så jeg selv har studert både bachelor og mastergrad i Storbritannia, men vi har da erfaring fra forskjellige land da. Og mer informasjon om de ulike universitetene, tingene dere kan studere og hva vi kan hjelpe til med, finner dere da den beste ressursen, er kanskje nettsiden vår, som dere forhåpentligvis allerede har vært innom. Og så er vi også på Instagram, Facebook, og så prøver vi også å få til litt mer innhold på YouTube-kanalen vår, sånn at dere får et bedre inntrykk og har et best mulig beslutningsgrunnlag på hvor dere skal studere. Så Sonor har rundt 60 forskjellige samarbeidsuniversitet fordelt på disse landene. Og på de 60 universitetene er det rundt 5,5 forskjellige studieretninger som dere kan søke på. Til sammenligning er det sånn at man gjennom samordnet opptak kan søke på rundt 25 institusjoner for høyere utdanning og rundt 1300 studieprogram. Så med andre ord finnes det en verden av muligheter utenfor kongerikets grenser. Men det er... Det finnes veldig mange valg, men hvorfor skal man velge å studere i utlandet? Og det er det mange gode grunner til å gjøre. Og vi skal ta oss og se litt nærmere på ti grunner som jeg pleier å gi når jeg holder foredrag. Og disse påstandene er ikke sånn at jeg har funnet på disse selv. Det er basert på informasjon fra en forskningsrapport som er publisert av NIFU. Og den forskningsrapporten så på hvordan de som har studert i utlandet klarer seg sammenlignet med de som har studert i Norge. Og den studien konkluderte med at de som har studert i utlandet kommer raskere ut i jobb etter endt utdanning, at utenlandsstudentene føler mer mestring på den jobben som de starter på. Det vil si at de føler at de håndterer de situasjonene de faktisk møter i arbeidslivet på en bedre måte. Det er en høyere andel som er i lederstillinger etter fem og ti år i arbeidslivet. De har samme eller høyere lønn. Det vil si at innenfor samfunnsfagene er det veldig små forskjeller som man kan egentlig ikke konkludere om det er bedre å studere i utlandet eller å studere hjemme i Norge med takke på lønn. Men alle andre fagkretser er det en viss økonomisk fordel ved å studere i utlandet. I hvert fall med tanke på lønn. Flere studiemuligheter har vi også sett litt på. Generelt sett er også utenlandsstudentene mer fornøyd med utdanningen sin. Flere fullfører på normert tid. Flere har internasjonale karriere, og det gjelder da særlig de som har studert typ samfunnsfag. Bedre i språk og bedre kulturforståelse er selvfølgelig også et naturlig følge av at man har studert i utlandet. Og så er det også heldigvis sånn at studier i utlandet er også tilgjengelig for alle. Du trenger ikke ha en rik onkel i USA eller en tante i Skottland. Lånekassa er din den og vil støtte deg uansett hvor du velger å studere av Zoom og sine universitet. For det er sånn at alle de universitetene som vi samarbeider med, de er godkjent for studiestøtte av lånekassa. Vi skal se litt nærmere på lånekassa etter hvert, men jeg skal også ta med det siste punktet her, som kanskje er det viktigste, og det er opplevelser og venner for livet. Som sagt har jeg selv studert i Storbritannia, men selv om jeg studerte i Storbritannia, så var det ikke sånn at jeg bare ble venn med briter. Jeg ble del av internasjonalt fellesskap og har fått venner fra hele verden. Det liker jeg kanskje best å eksemplifisere med det bildet her. Hun som er fremst der i den hvite kjolen, det er hun jeg giftet meg med for ca. tre år siden. Det her er alle nasjonalitetene som var representert i brunnen på vårt. Som dere ser, er det folk fra stort sett alle verdens hjørner, og fra veldig mange forskjellige nasjonaliteter. Det er en av de virkelig flotte tingene jeg synes jeg har fått ut av, for i tillegg til en fantastisk akademisk kompetanse, så er det dette nettverket som jeg har fått, som jeg er veldig, veldig fornøyd med. 
så skal vi se litt nærmere på lånekassa, bare helt kort liksom, de viktigste tingene som dere trenger å vite om eh, per dags dato. Og som sagt så er lånekassa der for dere og gjør det mulig for dere å studere i utlandet. Så man får utbetalt tre sekker med penger. Eh, det er basisstøtte, skolepengestøtte og reisestøtte. Reisestøtten eh, varierer litt fra land til land hvor mye den er. Til Europa så er den 5000 kroner, og til Australia for eksempel er den 27000 kroner. Den blir da utbetalt som 35 prosent stipend og 65 prosent lån som skal betales tilbake. Årsaken til at det er litt forskjellig nivå på støtten er at tanken er at det skal dekke to hjemreiser i året, og det koster litt mer å reise mellom Norge og Australia enn det gjør mellom Norge og Storbritannia for eksempel. Så er det også sånn at man da får utbetalt det som heter basisstøtte. Den er den samme uansett hvor, man, hvor i verden man studerer. Om det er i Norge, eh, Skottland, eh, Australia eller i USA, så er den den samme uansett. Da får du utbetalt i løpet av et helt år, så får du utbetalt 126 000 kroner. Og så blir 75 000 av det lån, mens resten blir gjort om til stipend når du står på eksamen. Og så er det skolepengestøtten. Her er det da sånn at bildet er litt mer komplisert, men enkelt forklart så får du utbetalt det skolen koster, og så betaler du tilbake rundt 35 000, blir rundt 35 000 av det du betaler i skolepenger gjort om til stipend. Og så er det en eh, viktig tilleggsting jeg kan legge til det med skolepenger, og det er det som heter ekstra stipend fra lånekassa. Og der er da University of Glasgow er en av de universitetene som er på den tilleggsstipendlista, som gjør at dere kan få, der ser jeg litt gammelt tall, dere kan få rundt 75 000 ekstra i stipend dersom dere får opptak på en av disse skolene, og det er blant University of Glasgow. Så det er lånekassa egentlig sånn i korte trekk. Dere søker etter at dere har fått opptak på et universitet. Da. Så jeg tenker at det er i grunn det jeg har tenkt å si på nåværende tidspunkt. And I think this is the perfect time to bring in today's guest speaker. Mark, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you for having me. Um, nice to see you all here. Thank you very much for... Uh, for, for coming along. So I'm, I'm just going to share my screen now. I've got um, a bit of a presentation uh, to, to take you through um, this evening um, and then happy to, to take any questions uh, at the end of the session um, if that sounds okay to you. So let me just double check that everything is looking okay. Perfect. And there we go. So one second. Right. Just bear with me. Right. Okay. Sorry about this. Just give me one second. Sorry, folks. Uh, no worries, Mark. Uh, everything, everything was fine up until two seconds ago. Um, give me one, one second. Stop this for a second. So I, I, while I'm figuring this out, I'll kind of tell you what I'm going to cover in my presentation tonight. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction um, to the University of, of Glasgow. I'll talk a little bit about our subjects, our rankings. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, Scotland generally and kind of student life as a, as a student in, in Scotland and, and at Glasgow. Um, and, and then, yeah, um, as I say, we'll kind of go through a little bit about finance, scholarships. I know uh, Tom, Thomas was just talking there a little bit about funding opportunities and things. So uh, I will um, take you through all of that and then happy to, to kind of allow time um, for, for some questions uh, at the end of the session. So um, for some reason, I don't appear to be able to go full screen. Um, so let me just try and do this. Um, and then, oh, OK, uh, sorry about this. Right, I think I'll just start like this, um, and if there's then any way that I can sort this out as we go along, um, I will I will do it. Uh, there we go, finally. Okay, so um, thank you everyone, sorry about that. So my name is Mark Stansfield, and I'm the Senior International Officer uh, for Norway and Europe um, here at the, the University of Glasgow. So 
Just to give you a little bit of an introduction to, to kick things off, um, so the University of Glasgow is one of the UK's ancient institutions. So Glasgow was established uh, way back in 1451, um, and we are the fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world. Um, there are six ancients in the UK, four in Scotland and two in England, so Oxford and Cambridge in England, and then you have Glasgow, Edinburgh, St Andrews and Aberdeen are the four um, in, in Scotland. Um, Glasgow was voted the world's friendliest city uh, by, by Rough Guides. Um, as you can all probably tell from my accent, um, I'm a biased source. I'm Scottish, I'm from Glasgow, um, but it is something that we do get feedback from our students about that they do find Glasgow to be a really friendly um, and really welcoming city. Um, lots to do at the university, clubs and societies, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit um, more time. Uh, I will also explain our kind of degree system. I could see when, when Thomas asked at the beginning that we have a couple of students interested in master's programmes, but I think the majority are interested in, in bachelor's, and I'll explain a little bit about the Scottish system and, and how that differs to, to other parts of, of the UK. Um, and then just something to mention that we're really proud of is the percentage of our students that are in full-time employment or further study within six months, uh, just shy of 96%, um, and testament to the opportunities that the university provides and in terms of internships, um, in terms of our reputation worldwide, um, that employers actively want to come to Glasgow um, to, to recruit our students, which is something that um, you know, I think is important when you're thinking about where you might want to, to study. So just to paint a little bit of a kind of further picture of, of Glasgow, um, in terms of rankings, we are one of the world's top 100 universities. So this year we were ranked 77th in the world in the QS rankings um, and this year we um, we were ranked 86th in the world according to the Times Higher Education um, World Rankings um, and, and kind of 10th in the UK within that worldwide context um, as well. Last year we were also um, awarded the UK University of the Year Award which is something that we were um, very very proud of. Um, we're quite a large institution, certainly by Scottish terms. Um, so this year we have around 30,000 students studying with us at Glasgow, um, and they're due to be coming from around 140 different countries. So um, as you would expect at a world-class institution, um, a really international environment on campus, um, and, and everyone benefits from that. You'll be studying with students from, from all over the world. Um, we are also a member of the, the Russell Group, which um, is a group of kind of elite research intensive universities in the UK. Um, students often ask me, what does that mean? Why is that important when I'm thinking about where I want to study? And of course, you have lots of factors to consider, some of which I'll touch upon and, you know, cost, location, uh, subject area, environment, um, you know, so lots of things for you to be thinking about. Um, but one thing around the kind of the Russell Group just to stress is that we are research intensive universities and what that means is that um, you know we're all conducting world leading research and that filters down to what we teach on our programs so you're being taught by world leading experts that are you know really leading in their field and also what you're being taught is, is relevant and um, it's as up to date as it can be and um, the facilities at russell group universities are are fantastic student satisfaction um, is always very high and future opportunities in terms of employment are really high as a, as a graduate of a Russell Group institution in the UK. And final ranking, um, we uh, just last week, The Guardian announced their, their new UK rankings, which placed us 11th in the UK. So according to most of the rankings, we're kind of 10th or 11th. That places us second in Scotland, uh, just behind St Andrews. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but this just gives you an idea of some of the subject areas that we are particularly well ranked for in the UK. So areas around medicine, dentistry, accounting and finance, education, uh, law, engineering, and also some of our art subjects, so things like film and TV, theatre studies as well. So just giving you a flavour for some of the areas that we are kind of top three, top five in the UK. So as I mentioned, we've been around since 1451. So we are um, an old ancient institution. Um, and we like to think that we've had a pretty positive impact um, on the world in, in those, those 500 and so years that we've, we've been in existence. Um, so I wanted to pull out just a few notable former students um, at Glasgow that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so Adam Smith, the kind of founder of forefather of modern economics, was a student and a professor at Glasgow, the author of The Wealth of Nations, um, and our triple accredited business school um, is now named after um, Adam Smith. 
James Watt was a real key figure in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Lord Kelvin developed the Kelvin temperature scale, which is still widely used throughout the world to this day. John Logie Baird, who invented the television, um, was, a, was an academic and student at Glasgow. Uh, Joseph Black, chemist. Um, we've had seven Nobel Prize winners associated with the university. And on top of these, a few other examples to give you is the first use of antiseptic in surgery was developed at Glasgow. The first ultrasound of an unborn baby was developed at the University of Glasgow. Um, the first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, um, is a law graduate from Glasgow. So just giving you a flavour of some of the kind of world changers that have passed through Glasgow's gates. And, and we are always very looking forward, very much looking forward to the next generation of students who may come to join us and who will make their mark um, on the world. Now, um, this is perhaps against my better judgment because I had a couple of YouTube videos that I wanted to show, but given the technical issues that I had at the beginning, this might turn out to be a bit of a gamble, but I think, I think we'll do it. I think a presentation is always a little bit more interesting if you've got a bit of a video or something to watch rather than just me talking at you. So um, first of all, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction um, to, to Scotland for those of you who have never visited before. Perfect. So um, just giving you a little bit of an introduction to, um, to, to Scotland there. Um, so in 2019, Rough Guides actually voted Scotland the most beautiful country in the world. Now, uh, I've spent a considerable amount of time in Norway. Uh, I have family in Oslo. Uh, and I think that, you know, it might be a pretty close run thing. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Rough Guides um, did say that Scotland came out on top. So don't, don't shoot the messenger. Um, but as you probably saw from the video, some pretty similar landscapes to, 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 to Norway, um, you know, stunning mountains, um, lochs, outdoor activities. So there really is something for everyone. And um, the image in the background of the slide here is of Ben Anne, which is a hill, which is around 30 minutes outside of Glasgow. Takes maybe around about an hour to climb. So nice to hike on a, on a sunny day. Um, so lots to do. Highland adventures, winter sports are also very popular here in Scotland as well. Um, Scotland's also famous for its culture, um, our art scene, our live music scenes, theatre, comedy festivals, music festivals, which take place all over the country. But a lot of that is particularly focused in Glasgow, which I think is safe to say is the kind of cultural capital of, of, of Scotland, um, Edinburgh being the actual capital, um, but Glasgow being a city where there's so much happening, a real vibrant, young, um, diverse and, and really interesting city. Um, and a lot of history in Scotland as well. So again, as you saw from the video, castles, ancient attractions, and um, just a really beautiful environment that when you do get some time at the weekends when you're not studying, uh, a real beautiful country to explore, just like, just like where you're coming from in Norway. Um, okay, a quick second video to try and give you um, a little bit of an introduction to, um, to the city of Glasgow now. <laughs>
perfect. So um, hopefully giving you a little bit of a flavour um, of the city. Uh, oops, sorry, excuse me. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, Glasgow is Scotland's biggest city by population. Um, Edinburgh is the capital. Um, to put that in context, Glasgow has a total population of around 560,000 people. Um, so, so a pretty big city, certainly by, by Scottish terms. Um, it was ranked in the world's top 10 best cities in the world by Time Out magazine in 2019. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, was voted the world's friendliest city by Rough Guides as well. Um, we're the fourth largest city in the UK, so you have London, Birmingham, Manchester, and then Glasgow. Um, the image that you can see here has a couple of music venues, so that's the Armadillo and the Hydro. Um, Glasgow is a UNESCO city of music. Um, things are getting back to some semblance of normality here um, uh, with the pandemic, so there's more events happening, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the impact on the university in a second. Um, but in kind of pre-pandemic times, there were about 120 different live music events happening in the city every week, everything from classical to techno and, and everything in between. There really is something for, for everyone. Um, Glasgow is a very green city, as you possibly saw from the video. We have over 90 parks and green spaces, and the name actually translates into Scottish Gaelic as Dear Green Place, is what Glasgow um, kind of translates to. So um, the university is in the west end of the city, which is um, around a 10-minute journey by subway or around a 30 minute walk from the city centre um, and the West End's a really nice part of the city it's, it's where the university is it's where I live and um, lots of nice little boutique shops and cafes we have Kelvin Grove Art Gallery which is in the image in the background here that you also saw in the video uh, the Botanic Gardens are out in the West End um, and a real nice community feel around the university um, you know, very quickly you'll get to know people in Glasgow and, and really easy to, to kind of, you'll bump into to friends and, and people that you know around the West End. So a, a real nice kind of part of the city um, for, for you to study and, and to, to live in um, as well. So um, this is an aerial shot of, of the University of, of Glasgow. And I just wanted to point out a couple of kind of key areas on, on campus. So as you'll have seen from my background and from those videos, that's the main building, the, the tower that kind of dominates the, the Glasgow skyline. Um, that was designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott, um, and, and yeah, that is a functioning building, so it's not just a, a relic that looks nice in pictures. Um, academic departments such as the business school have a presence there, uh, geography, school of law, so it is an active teaching building, and it's likely at some point, if you join us at Glasgow, you will have classes um, in, that, in that main building. We have a very modern 13th floor library with over 2 million books. Um, lots of space for students uh, to, to, to study um, and lots of really interesting kind of special collections and manuscripts and, and things like that as well, if you're interested in, in that. Uh, we have three museums on campus as well. Um, we have um, the, the kind of green and blue building where my cursor is, is our International Student Support Student Services building. Um, so as you'll see, it's a city campus, but fairly compact and, and really easy to get from, from one side to another would, would kind of take no longer than about 10 minutes to, to get from the very bottom to, to the very top. Um, and a really nice environment, Kelvin Grove Park kind of borders the, the university, so a real nice green space for you to, to go and enjoy the, the sunshine that we do get sometimes here in Glasgow that you can go and, and do some studying. Um, very quickly, um, I just want, also wanted to touch upon um, the fact that we are kind of undergoing a, a really exciting entering into a really exciting chapter currently at the university and um, we're investing a billion pounds in developing our campus um, and this has been possible because um, a hospital moved to another part of the city and the university always owned that land and um, so now that the hospital is gone we are now able to, to redevelop our campus and um, it's the most significant expansion of any uk university if not european university this century um, there's lots of exciting things happening, a brand new business school, a brand new school of engineering, a new learning hub, um, buildings for us to be ramping up our research in certain areas around chronic diseases, working in partnership with industry, um, supporting small startups that students might have, providing funding and space. So a really, really exciting time um, that's really putting Glasgow at the forefront of kind of modern tech technology. A couple of the buildings are finished already and I've been in and it's, uh, it's amazing, really exciting time. And that real nice mix of the old and ancient that I've talked about, but also cutting edge facilities that you would expect from you know, one of the best universities in the world. Um, 
this is one of the new buildings that just opened. Uh, I took some of these snaps a few weeks ago when I was in. So this is a James Bethune Smith Learning and Teaching Hub, um, and it's open now to, to students. So um, the pictures maybe don't do it justice, but uh, a lovely modern space that, that is now fully functioning. So um, moving on then, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Norway and the University of Glasgow. So we have a really long established relationship with, with Norway and Norwegian students and, and Norwegian institutions. Um, I think there's a lot of shared culture between Scotland and, and Norway. We are close geographically, uh, and I think we are we're kind of, um, you know, sort of pretty similar um, in, in many ways. Um, each year the number varies, but this year we are expecting approximately 50 students from Norway to be, to be joining us um, at Glasgow, so a, a nice little contingent. Um, we have a number of really valued partnerships with Norwegian institutions as well, um, including NTNU, uh, the University of Bergen, uh, University of Oslo, uh, UIT, um, and, and those partnerships take a variety of different, different forms, and if anyone has questions about that, I can take those at the end. Um, we have a Nordic Student Society at the university as well, um, so a really exciting chance for you to, if you wish, meet up with other students from, from Norway and other kind of Nordic countries, um, uh, celebrate National Day, organise social events, so if you're missing home and, and want to kind of link up with, with some students from home, there is the opportunity for you to, to do that. And we have quite an active alumni network in Norway as well, you know, because we have a long established relationship and we've been welcoming Norwegian students for a very long time. There's a really active kind of a uh, network of former students in, in Norway who organise events, who organise kind of mentoring and things. So um, just to highlight that that, that is available um, as well. Now, being one of the large ancient universities, we offer a broad range of, of subjects. And I'm conscious that I don't want to talk for too long today, so I'm not going to, you'll be pleased to hear, go into too much detail about all of them. Um, but we offer a pretty broad range of courses across arts and humanities, languages, our business school, computing science, education, engineering, law, one of the largest medical schools in Europe, um, politics and international relations, psychology, sciences across biological sciences, physics, chemistry, uh, life sciences, um, and also veterinary sciences as well. So obviously more information on our website. And again, I can take any particular questions at the end. Uh, but a pretty broad offering at Glasgow in terms of the, the subjects that, that we offer. And we are split into a college structure, which is pretty common at kind of ancient universities in the UK. So we have four colleges, the College of Arts, College of Science and Engineering, College of Social Sciences, which also includes the Business School, and the College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences um, is, the, is the fourth one um, as well. And um, just a quick one, because often this gets a little bit confusing, um, is that uh, a BA, so a bachelor degree um, from University of Glasgow uh, is actually called an MA, but it's not a master's, it's a bachelor's. Um, this is an ancient university thing. I'm not sure why it's the same at the other ancients, um, but just to highlight that we have kind of sort of three degree options. So uh, a bachelor of arts, which is an MA, uh, a bachelor of arts and social sciences, which is a, an MA social sciences, uh, or a BSc, which is a Bachelor um, of, of Science, which tends to be science and engineering and, and medicine related programmes. Now, I saw at the beginning that the majority of attendees today are looking at bachelor or undergraduate study. So I just wanted to talk a, a couple of slides about the Scottish system and how that differs from other parts of the UK. Now, we study for four years in Scotland um, as standard. And um, that's what I did, that's what my, my peers did. Um, in other parts of the UK, you might find that a bachelor's degree would be three years in length. Now, um, that's how it's always been in Scotland. Um, it's the system that's been kind of adopted and adapted by the US, where you have major and minor subjects. That's kind of derived originally from, from the Scottish system. Um, so in year one, you study three subjects. Um, so in this example, this student has applied for physics. And in year one, they will also pick up optional modules around chemistry and astronomy. Um, in year two, you carry on with two of those subjects and you have the option to pick another if you want. So the student has decided to carry on with chemistry, but maybe leave um, astronomy behind. Um, in year th at the end of year two, you then pick what you want to specialise in. So the student has decided, yep, physics is for me. Um, and will end up graduating with a single honours degree in, in physics. However, that can change and it can be flexible. So in this example, this is a, a, an MA. Um, Example, so this student has applied for business and management. 
they've picked up Spanish and history in year one, then they've dropped history, picked up music in year two. Uh, then at the end of year two, they've decided, actually, I want to study business and Spanish. Um, year three would also be a year abroad in a Spanish speaking country. Um, and then year four is the final kind of senior honours. So it's just to highlight that it can change. You can try and test out different subjects early on. You can drop subjects. You can pick up additional ones. So the Scottish system is good if you're not 100% sure exactly what you want to do. Now, you have to know what you want to apply for, of course. Um, but you do have that flexibility to kind of change your mind. Because often you might be picking up subjects that you haven't really done properly at school before. So how do you know that you've picked the right, the right options? Um, and it's something that employers seem to value. Um, the percentage of graduates from Scottish universities going into full-time employment is always higher than the UK average. And their starting salary is always happy, higher than the UK average as well. And I think it's down to a few factors, but one is that we tend to create graduates who have a broad knowledge in more than one discipline. And there's nothing wrong with being focused if you know what you want to do, but there are clear advantages as well of kind of having that broad introduction um, and, and kind of trying and testing out kind of different, different subjects. So on to our undergraduate entry requirements for students coming from, from Norway. Um, we have some slightly different requirements depending on, on the subject, but generally speaking, uh, we're normally looking for a, an overall grade average of about 4.5 or above um, in, in, the, in the Norwegian high school qualification. Um, then we're either looking for 4.5 or 5.0 in required subjects. Now, we're normally looking for five in some of our more difficult subjects with higher entry requirements. So things like law, engineering, computer science, we would generally be looking for the required subjects to be um, at a five. Um, and those required subjects are listed on all of the programme pages on the website. So if you're kind of not sure, um, you know, so for example, for engineering, it would normally be a science and maths that we would be, we would be looking for. And um, for anyone who is doing A-levels, uh, again, it's a sliding scale, but anywhere from a couple of programmes that remain two Bs, uh, anywhere up to three As. Um, and for anyone who's doing the, the IB programme, um, again, anywhere between 32 and 38, depending on the programme. For most subjects, I would say sort of 34, 36, generally, that, that we're looking for. Uh, but again, any questions about that, you can ask me at the end, or of course, Thomas and the Sonar team. Um, I've had great success in helping Norwegian students come to study at Glasgow. So they know all of this, they know it inside out. I'm always at the other end of the email as well. So I'm happy to kind of answer any questions. Uh, I noticed that we had a, a kind of couple of postgraduate master's students attending this evening. So generally we're looking for applicants who have a kind of GPA of 3.0 or above or 1.6 to, to kind of 2.5. Again, varies from, from program to program. Um, hopefully that makes sense, but again, if you've got any questions about that, please let me know, and there's a little bit more detail on the Norway page on our website, so if you just go to the Glasgow website and type in Norway. Um, another requirement when looking to study would be um, being able to demonstrate your level of, of English language. Um, so if you have taken English um, in, in Vitmal and you scored four or above, uh, you do not need to take uh, a certified English language test. We're, we're happy to accept that your English is at a suitable level. Um, if you do decide to take an English language test or you do have to take one, we accept IELTS, TOEFL, um, Pearson Academic, um, and we continue to be as flexible as we can be around that in terms of accepting some online tests. We understand as a result of, of COVID-19, a lot of test centres have been closed. It's been difficult to, to take tests. So we are continuing to be as flexible as we can with, with, with students. Um, so in terms of how to apply, um, so again, this is something that, that Thomas and, and the Sonor team will be able to, to give you a lot of support with. But if applying to the UK, you would generally apply via UCAS, which is the kind of centralised admission service here in the UK. And you can apply for up to five universities or five courses on, on UCAS. So you have the option to, to kind of use those five choices as, as you wish. Uh, we do also accept applications via the Common App, which tends to be more US focused. Um, but just to highlight that you can only submit through one or the other. So uh, Common App isn't a way to get around the, the five institution or five program limit on UCAS. So it would be uh, one or the other with UCAS being the, the most common. Um, there are kind of early deadlines for programmes like medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine. Uh, that, that deadline is, um, is in October each year. For, for the rest of the programmes, we have an equal consideration deadline on the 26th of January, I think it is next year. 
but we do accept applications from international students right up until June. So you do have time, but my advice is kind of the earlier the better. For those of you interested in master study, you would just apply directly through the Glasgow website. Um, you can apply before you've received your final grades, and, and that's obviously the same um, at undergraduate level as well. Um, and you would just upload documents once you, once you get them. Any offer that we might make may just be conditional um, upon you achieving a certain final grade, for example. Um, and we generally don't charge an application fee for most of our programmes, but we do for our master's programmes in our Adam Smith Business School. This is just because of the sheer volume of applications that we get in an attempt to make sure that applicants are serious about, about coming to join us. So there's a £25 fee for any of the business school master's programmes, but no charges for, for any others. Um, and again, at postgraduate level, we need to see your transcripts, any translations, um, proof of your English language, a copy of your passport, sometimes a reference, and perhaps a letter of motivation as well, depending on the programme. But again, lots more information on the website about all of that. And of course, Thomas and the team will be happy to, to give you some advice. So um, tuition fees for the forthcoming academic year are just being confirmed at the moment. So I'm just using this current academic year that's just started as an example. Um, so this is our undergraduate fees per year of study. Um, so varying from sort of 19 up to sort of 23 for the vast majority of our programmes. As you'll see, the clinical programmes are significantly more than that. Um, that's just because of the way these programmes work with the National Health Service here in the UK or in Scotland and the clinical placements and hospitals and things that take place through, through these. So as you'll see, um, it's significantly more expensive to be studying um, medicine, dentistry or veterinary medicine than it is for the, the vast majority of our, our programmes. Um, and you will be pleased to know that we do have some scholarships for Norwegian students. So at undergraduate level, we have um, a now unlimited number of undergraduate excellent scholarships now. This has been confirmed that the value of these for the forthcoming year will be £7,000 per year of study. So that is assigned automatically if you meet the criteria, um, which is generally based on your, your overall high school grade. Um, and again, those are being reviewed at the moment. But if you are thinking about Glasgow and want to know more about scholarships, you know, please drop me a line and I'll be happy to, to kind of share a little bit more information when I have it. Um, so £7,000 per year of study for, for all four years. Um, awarded on academic merit, so you don't apply, you will be assessed by admissions when you submit your application. Um, and generally, you'll find out whether you've been offered one of these within two weeks um, of submitting your, your application. Um, so, um, uh, you know, a little bit of funding there available um, in, in terms of a, a scholarship. Um, at postgraduate level, onto our fees there, again, varying between sort of anything from 19 up to about £24,000 for most programmes. Um, our undergraduate degrees are four years, our master's degrees are one year, um, which is kind of standard across the UK. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, there are a few programmes that are two years in length, but the vast majority, a standard MSc in the UK, uh, would, be, would be one year um, of study. And again, pleased to say that we do have some scholarships available at postgraduate level as well. Uh, we have a number of £10,000 awards. Um, so again, often covering kind of more than 50% of the tuition fee. Um, we have some subject specific awards. Uh, the business school have their own awards as well. Um, so again, check out the scholarships page on the website and, and, and have a look. Again, most of those are, are kind of awarded on academic merit. So looking at your GPA from your bachelor study, but there are some non kind of um, uh, sort of non academic based ones as well. So definitely have a, have a look. Um, and I know I won't go on too much about the Lonne Casa because I know that uh, Tom talked a little bit about that at the beginning, but just to highlight that those loans and some extra sort of stipend funding is available for Glasgow just to help um, kind of cover some of your, your, your tuition and living costs. So, uh, but again, I, I won't talk too much about that because I know that, um, that, that Thomas kind of spoke about that. Um, you'll be pleased to hear I've got a few slides left and then I'm happy to to take some questions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about living costs in, in Glasgow. Um, it's something that I'm often asked about. Um, so Glasgow, as I mentioned, big city in Scottish terms, but also um, was found to be kind of the fourth most affordable student city in the UK, which I found interesting. It's unusual for a fourth biggest city to also be the fourth most affordable. Um, so this gives you a very rough idea of kind of what you can expect to be paying each month as a student at Glasgow. 
Um, now, just to highlight that this is by no means exact, I think it's safe to say that many students spend less than this each month. Um, probably safe to say that some students spend significantly more than that each month as well. Um, your, your biggest cost will be accommodation. And I'll talk about university accommodation in a second. Um, beyond that, it kind of depends on, can you cook or are you going to be eating out or getting takeaways every night? Um, do you need to be spending £70 a month on clothes? Uh, do you need to be spending £120 on entertainment going out? It's kind of up to you, but this gives you a rough idea. This is what some current students have kind of told us um, that, that they spend. So, um, you know, a, a reasonably affordable city to, 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 to live in. In terms of student life, um, as you would expect, again, from a university such as Glasgow, we offer lots of support for our students through accommodation, through um, support with, with visas, which is obviously a, a new thing for Norwegian students. Uh, I can't believe I've managed to be kind of speaking for over half an hour and I haven't talked about Brexit yet. Um, obviously, one of the outcomes of the UK's decision to leave the EU, um, which just to caveat wasn't uh, wasn't how the vote went in Scotland. Um, but one of the fallouts of that is our kind of leaving the, the kind of common travel area. Um, and as a result, Norwegian students now requiring a visa to study in the UK, which, which they never needed before. So just to highlight that we have a dedicated visa team who can help you with that. Um, you know, we know it's new. I think as a university, we are still kind of getting on top of that from what that means for Norwegian and European students. So we have support available. Um, we have a disability service. So if you needed any extra support with your studies, uh, anything that we needed to know in advance, um, you're able to, to kind of share that. Um, and our, our disability support team can, can help with that. We have a fantastic career service. Um, if you take anything away from my presentation today, if you do come to Glasgow, I would say engage with the career service as early as you can. Go along to their events. Uh, they organise careers fairs on campus. They advertise internship opportunities, paid work experience opportunities. The more you engage with them, the you know the more prepared you're going to be when it comes to, to looking for work post study, whether that be here in Scotland or whether it be back home in Norway or somewhere else. Um, we do a lot of great work with big multinational corporations to small startups. Um, so engage with them would be my advice if you're looking for. For, for kind of internship and, and future opportunities. And we have a student counselling service as well, as you would imagine, that's become particularly important over the past 12 to 18 months with students facing real disruption to their studies as a result of the pandemic. Um, pleased to say that this academic year is going to be resembling a little bit more of a normality. I think um, there will still be a hybrid approach as I think most universities will be doing where some large classes will, will continue to be online, but we are confident and in line with the Scottish government guidance that there will be more face-to-face -face activity happening on campus this year. For example, Freshers' Week is happening this week, kind of Welcome Week. So there's lots of activities happening on campus, small tutorials and, and, and group work will be taking place on campus. Um, but I think at the moment, the days of having 500 students in a lecture theater um, are still a little bit of a way off. Um, the Scottish government has been quite cautious in terms of the easing of restrictions and face coverings and social distancing. Um, but we, you know, hopefully by the time any of you might be joining us, um, things will be back to, to normal. Um, lots to get involved in. We have a student representative council. We have a very active student body at Glasgow, very political, very focused on sustainability, very focused on the environment. Um, lots of clubs and societies. So aside from the Nordic Society that I mentioned, we have everything you could imagine from the bad movie society that meet up to watch rubbish films to the tea drinking appreciation society, you name it, there's probably a club or society for it. And if there isn't, we can start one. Um, so lots of sports as well. We have quite a sport orientated university and um, fantastic facilities that you can get involved in. Um, promise only a couple of slides left. Um, accommodation, um, we have over 3,500 rooms, university uh, dormitories um, for, for students who come to, to study with us at Glasgow. Um, and we guarantee um, international students a place in, in those residences if you want, provided you've applied by the deadline, which is normally August for courses starting in September um, each year. We have separate undergraduate and postgraduate residences. Um, all but one of those are within walking distance of the campus. 
Um, we have one at our vet school, which is on a, a separate campus around 20 minutes away from the main one that you, that you saw in the image. Um, that's a catered residence where students have the option of a meal plan, but the others aren't. The others you would just have a kitchen and uh, left to, to fend for yourself. Um, you'll always have your own room, so we don't have dormitories where you would be sharing a room. Um, but we also have different options. So we have en suites where you would have your own bathroom and shower, others where you would just have your room and you would be sharing shower bathroom facilities with other students. So there's a sliding scale of cost depending on what you want to go for. Um, but generally speaking, on average, I think probably about £550 per month. Some are a little bit cheaper than that and some are a little bit more expensive than that. There are staff in each of the residences 24 hours a day. So very safe, very close to campus and, and a good option if you're thinking about, about joining us, at least for first year. At the end of first year, you know, you hope to have made lots of friends from your clubs and societies, from the various classes that you've been in. Um, and you might choose to maybe look at a private apartment or something with your friends after year one. Um, but the option to continue is there. And um, we just hold most of the rooms back for, for new students. So student support, as I've already kind of, already kind of covered this, so just to highlight, we have a doctor surgery on campus. Um, you know, we are proud of how we support our students, despite being quite a large institution um, and an ancient institution and a highly ranked institution. Uh, you know, we, we are here to support you. Um, I'm here to help before you apply or when you apply. And then once you get here, we have some fantastic people working at the university that will make sure that you're, you're okay. Um, final thing I wanted to share before I'm, I'll be quiet and I take some questions, um, just to highlight that we have a, an Ask a Student or Ask Our Staff system on the website. So you can filter by bachelor's or master's, you can filter by subject, you can filter by country. Last time I checked, I was still working on getting a Norwegian student on there. I don't think we have anyone from Norway yet, um, but I'm working on it. Um, but you can filter and you can speak to a, a current student who's on the programme that you're interested in. Uh, we don't tell these students what to say. We provide them with some basic training. But other than that, you're getting to speak to a real life Glasgow Uni student about what it's like to study that subject or what, what it's like to be a student in the city. Um, I've got a profile on there as well. So if you do want to, to speak to me about anything or have any questions, uh, you can find me on there um, and, and, and ask away. Uh, but equally, uh, I thought before I finish up, I'll share my email address as well. So it's just my name, mark.stansfield at glasgow.ac.uk. So, um, of course, I would urge you to go through colleagues at, at Sonor in the first instance. They'll be really happy to help and will probably know the answer to most of your questions. Uh, if not, they'll get in touch with me. But just to highlight, if you if you do want to get in touch with me directly, um, that's my email address. But, um, but you know, definitely, uh, you know, use the expertise of the staff at Sonor. They're brilliant and um, they're a really valued partner of, of us at Glasgow. Um, um, and yeah, so thank you all very much for your patience. Apologies for the technical issues at the beginning. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have if there's anything I've missed. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for, for joining this evening. Um, and yeah, over to, to Thomas and I'll take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Perfect, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, so we have a question already, actually. Uh, I just need to bring up the chat box. So uh, first question of the evening is, uh, is there English literature? So is that the subject you offer? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, I mean, so, so yeah, we offer um, English literature programmes at, at both uh, bachelor's and um, postgraduate level as well. So those programmes sit within the College of Arts. Um, so, so yeah, again, there'll be the option for you to, to kind of team up something else with that. So it could be something else within arts. So if you wanted to pick up something around, uh, you know, another foreign language or, you know, kind of English language or linguistics um, or something totally different, um, you know, uh, you're able to, to do that. So, so yeah, we, we have an English literature programme um, at Glasgow with some fantastic academics um, working on that, some published authors and uh, creative writers and poets and things that are really active in, in, in Scotland and uh, worldwide that, that teach on that programme as well. So, uh, so yeah, but more information about the kind of modules is available on, on the website. So you can go on and have a look at um, exactly kind of what kind of content is covered um, as part of that programme and, and some of the opportunities that, that you have on it. Uh, but, but yeah, um, a good option. Uh, another question here then is uh, what are the biggest differences between doing a regular 
uh, in that joint degree? Good question. Yeah, thank, thanks, Amanda. Um, I think um, there are advantages to you know to both. I think I I, I ended up studying a single honours degree when, when I was a student um, at Glasgow and. Um, I had studied a number of different subjects, as I talked about, and then kind of narrowed it down because I had one particular field that I was really interested in. However, um, I didn't apply for that subject. I'd never really done it before at school. Uh, I picked it up as my third subject because I had to pick something, um, and I ended up really enjoying it and, and found a real passion for it. So, um, so, so that was my kind of experience um, in terms of kind of the dual option is that you, you graduate essentially with a degree in, in two different subject areas, which is certainly often seen as a real advantage by, by employers. Um, how that works is that in your final year, rather than you know, studying X number of modules in one subject, you kind of split that between the two. Um, but you normally only write one kind of dissertation or one research project. So you would pick which one of the two subjects that you would want to, would want to focus on. So um, you know, the difference is, you know, all along in the Scottish system for your first two years, you'll be studying more than one subject anyway. It just really comes down to at the end of your second year, do you just want to then focus on one or do you have an interest in two and that you want to kind of split your, your time between, between both of them? But, you know, you're not studying additional classes. It's not, uh, you know, you're just your modules or your number of credits are just split between two subjects rather than just doing it in, in one. So no major differences from, from that side of things. It's... Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, but please feel free to, to come back um, if there's anything else. Yeah. Thomas, it looks like I noticed that we missed one. So there was a, a question about, is it possible to have side jobs while you're yeah. working? So I can take that one. Yeah. Uh, the answer to that, uh, Nicole, is, is yes, um, you, you can. Um, so now, depending on your circumstances, it's likely that you will now require a visa to study in the UK, as I talked about briefly. Um, and, and with that, there is a kind of limit to how many hours you can work during term time. Um, so that's limited to 20 hours per week if you're coming on the student visa. Um, to be honest, I, I probably wouldn't recommend working any more than that anyway, because you will be studying full time. And I think trying to, to work any more than 20 hours is probably going to have a negative impact on your on your studies. So, so yeah, you can work part time. I would say most of our students at Glasgow do. Um, and there's lots of opportunities around the city, even on campus. So we, uh, you know, we hire students to, to kind of work as international student ambassadors for us, for example. So giving campus tours, speaking to prospective students such as yourself about what it's like to be a student at Glasgow. But also many students work in shops, coffee shops, bars, restaurants. So lots of opportunities. Um, so, yes, it is possible. And I would say most students do it while they're, while they're studying. And also, I believe uh, outside of the term time, they can, you, you can work more than 20 hours a week. So, for example, over the winter break or summer break, you can actually work uh, full time. So you're not limited to 20 hours a week. Absolutely. Uh, hmm. uh, do, do, how are your science facilities? Uh, good question, Catherine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, they're, they're excellent. I mean, I think we have we have lots of large labs. We have uh, within our kind of um, astronomy department, for example, we we have some real fantastic facilities. We also have our aerospace uh, engineering uh, program, which uh, again, some absolutely fantastic kind of facilities around modeling and, and things. So, so yeah, um, I think there's, you know, depending on the subject you're interested in, I know science is quite abroad, uh, you know, so we're doing chemistry, physics, biological sciences at, at Glasgow. Uh, but yeah, you know, lots of fantastic facilities, as you would expect from a, a reading research intensive university. We have some world leading scientists studying with us um, that have been involved in kind of major projects in, in recent years, such as uh, you know, the, the kind of CERN project and um, uh, detecting gravitational waves, kind of proving Einstein's theory was developed at Glasgow as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think the short answer is some, some really, really good facilities. But again, depending on the particular science subject you're interested in, we'll, we'll kind of be able to give you a little bit more information, but probably direct you to the website. There's a lot of really good stuff there about what we offer our, our, our students in, in that area. Mm. Um... Uh, how would getting a degree in law, more specifically international law, be structured? Sure. Um, good question. And so, um, so we offer two types of law program at bachelor's level here at Glasgow. Um, and that's because we have a different 
legal system in Scotland than the rest of the UK. So we offer Scots law, which is specific to Scotland and our legal system. But we also teach common law at Glasgow, which is the, the, the kind of system used in the rest of the UK, also in Canada, Australia, and some other parts of the world as well. So if studying at bachelor's level, you would choose either Scots law or common law. I would say most international students study common law because that's the one that's recognized further afield. Then the specialization. So the specialization kind of comes as you go along. So you can pick and choose particular modules that you're interested in, but there is a kind of core set of, of subjects and, and law related modules that you have to do in order to, to kind of complete the program. So generally specialization tends to come at master's level. So we offer uh, an MSc in international law. We offer, uh, in fact, a, a number of, of LLMs, uh, sorry, in, in, um, in a variety of different types of law at, at master's level. So generally in the UK, you would require a law undergraduate degree. Um, and then from there, you would kind of specialize generally at, at master's level. So if it was that international route that you wanted to go down, um, then there is the opportunity for you to, to, to do that um, at, at master's level. Just to highlight on law, we've, we've got one of the oldest law schools in, in the UK. I think on the last world rankings, I think we were 40th in the world for, for law. So it is an area that we, you know, that we do do really well. And I think all of the big law firms are pretty selective often about which universities they will hire students from for certain subjects and things. And, and I would say that Glasgow is, is one of the institutions that the, the big top law firms in the UK would, would come to recruit from because of the reputation of our law school. So just to throw that in there as well when, when you were asking about law. Uh, next question is backtracking a bit about the um, uh, joint honours uh, the degrees. Is it possible to start doing a single honours degree and then switch to a joint honours degree? Absolutely. Uh, I do, yeah, that, that's common. Um, you know, I think many students just apply for a single honours and then they pick something up as they go along. So um, as I mentioned, it's, it's normally at the end of year two that, that you make that decision as to what you want to carry on into, into honours. Um, so yeah, it's common that students just apply for a single honours and then end up with a, with a joint. And likewise, sometimes students apply for a joint honours and end up switching to, to a single. So, um, so yeah, it is possible that flexibility does exist. Um, there are some subjects that, you know, ones like medicine and dentistry and things, of course, that, that isn't the case. You're just studying that, that discipline. But for most other subjects, and you can see on the website, there's uh, if you go on the programme, so say, for example, you are interested in, let's pick finance. Uh, accountancy and um, so you can go on there and you can see all of the, the options that are available in terms of, of joint degrees but yeah flexibility once you've started to, to kind of pick and choose what, what you want to do yeah mm. and uh, so uh, the next question then is is it possible to study optometry at University of Glasgow and I Unfor think it is unfortunately not and no. no that's that's one of the few subjects that that we don't really do at Glasgow. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of, I think there's only one or two universities in Scotland that offer optometry. It's a, it's a pretty niche programme here. Yeah. Uh, I think Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh might be one of them to check out. They're very much specialised on kind of health and health sciences. So uh, I would definitely check out um, Queen Margaret University, who I think do it, um, but unfortunately not at Glasgow, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, the next question then is, do you know anything about licensing for vets uh, studying in Scotland? So I guess that's, uh, if I'm understanding that question correctly, is it possible to study veterinary science at the University of Glasgow, become a registered vet in, Glasgow, in, in Scotland and then work in Norway after, afterwards? So I think that's... That's how I read that question. Yeah, that, uh, that's my interpretation as well. And Amelia, yeah. really, feel free to come back if, if, if that if Thomas and I have misinterpreted. Um, yeah. It's a good question. I must admit, I, I do know that the our degree is accredited um, yeah. kind of all over the world. So we get a lot of Canadian and American students coming to study vet medicine with us because it's fully accredited. Thanks, mm -hmm. Amelia. So it's, it's fully accredited in the US and Canada. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, yes, if you, yeah. uh, you know where we're from. Yeah, Sorry, uh, no, no worries. Uh, so um, to become a registered vet in Norway, you have to get uh, it approved by application from Mat uh, Tilsyna. Uh, and um, um, it's, uh, it, it can be a bit tricky 
uh, to because you need to have the right uh, subject and stuff like that. But my uh, yeah, I, I can't say anything definite that it, it is possible to get it approved once you go back to Norway. Uh, but uh, uh, it's definitely possible. That's uh, all I feel comfortable saying. Uh, but if uh, you have any more questions about this, uh, uh, Amelia, um, you can ask your uh, Sonor counselor to help you contact uh, Matilsun in order to um, find out a bit more about the registration process. So, um, yeah. Um, how many students does the university take in every year? Uh, so that's that's a good question, and, and it, it varies from year to year, um, to, to, to be honest. So um, our total kind of population, as I talked about this year, is about 30,000, but that includes returning students that are obviously, um, you know, perhaps in year two or, or year three um, of, of their programme. Um, Registration is still ongoing for this year, and so I, I don't have the figures to hand, I'm afraid. But what I would say is that yeah, you know, we're we're a we're a large institution. We do have programs that are oversubscribed. You know, we we do receive an eye-watering number of applications. So it is competitive. There's no there's no doubting that. Um, however, um, you know, as you've seen, many Norwegian students do 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 study with us. And provided you are, you know, kind of roughly making the entry requirements that I talked about, there's a pretty high chance. Yeah. That as an international student, you will be made an offer to, to, to study with us. So uh, sorry that I don't have the exact figures to hand for this year. Um, but yeah, you're looking at a kind of total population um, of about 30,000 students, um, you know, and, and a large proportion of those being from outside of Scotland, outside of the UK um, as well. So a really diverse kind of group of students on campus. You will be studying with, with students from literally all over the world. Um, so, so yeah, but sorry that I don't have the exact figures to, to hand, but it, it does fluctuate. It does vary from, from year to year. Yeah. And as long as you meet sort of the, the rough uh, entry requirements that we outlined earlier and you apply, uh, yeah, early as well, uh, your chances of uh, getting, getting an offer from the university is, I would say, fairly high. Of course, we can't give any guarantees. We have to see your application first, but uh, yeah. Um, in my experience, um, uh, as long as you apply fairly early, it's, it should be too difficult. Um, next question, uh, would a year abroad at Glasgow through Antenu also be through Sonor? So, yeah. Uh, so I can take that one. So. Um, it, it kind of depends, I think, Thea. Um, so we, we have we have, an ex we have an agreement in place with, with NTNU in, in, in certain subject areas. So off the top of my head, because I visited them the last time I was in Trondheim, I know that we have a, a partnership in the area of um, product design engineering is one, uh, a couple of other engineering uh, programs, and I think some social science disciplines as well. So um, I think there are a couple of options. You can either come through one of those formalized exchange agreements that, that we have with, with, with NTNU. Um, but there is also the option kind of outside of that to, to kind of come as a, a kind of study abroad student, so not coming via um, what was Erasmus. Uh, again, uh, another outcome of Brexit is that the UK has decided to, to leave the Erasmus programme. Um, so we are currently kind of developing our own agreements with our partners to can try and continue. Uh, how things were within the within the Erasmus network. So, um, you know, it's something that Sonar might be able to help with. I think in the first instance, probably chatting with the study abroad team in Entenu would probably be the first port of call. Uh, but I think certainly if you needed any support or if you were interested in a subject that we don't have a formal agreement in place, then I would certainly urge you to, to speak to, to Sonar about that. They would certainly be able to, to, to kind of um, help you apply. Hmm. Yeah, more than more than happy. So, so the best for you would if you're a student at Antony, it would be best to go through their exchange program, but uh, you can also find, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a private option uh, through study outside Norway as well. So, yeah, um, that would be how you go about uh, getting a semester at the uh, University of Glasgow. Um, 
I don't see any more questions. Um, so uh, I think we're going to end uh, this webinar on that note. Is there anything you want to add before we say, good, say our goodbyes, uh, Mark? No, I don't think so, Thomas. Just to say, well, back, thank you for organising and for hosting. Uh, it's always always a pleasure, and, and thanks to you all for attending. I, I hope you found it helpful and uh, and interesting. Uh, please do keep in touch with with colleagues at Sonar if you know if you're thinking about Glasgow. Uh, just to say also that we will be doing a, a number of kind of information events virtually, and um, mm -hmm. so we'll have some virtual open days, some virtual kind of presentations around specific subjects. So I know my presentation this evening has been quite generic. So if you wanted to find out more, for example, about the science subjects or about law, um, then please do keep an eye on, we have a kind of virtual visit us section on the website. So definitely keep, keep your eyes peeled um, for, for things that are happening. Uh, I'm just sorry that I won't be in Norway in person to meet some of you. Uh, I'm not sure when travel will resume, hopefully early next year, uh, yeah. but who knows? Um, so yeah, so thanks for, for, for joining this evening. It was, it was nice to see so many of you here. Um, and I hope that maybe many of you will, will kind of choose to, to come and join us in, in Glasgow soon. So yeah. keep in touch and take care. And thank yeah. you. Thank you for uh, joining us, Mark, and thank you for uh, for taking out your time to uh, share your uh, your wisdom uh, of the uh, University of Glasgow. So, like uh, like Mark said, if you have any questions, don't feel uh, don't hesitate to contact. Uh, either me or uh, uh, one of the colleagues uh, of mine that you're already in contact with. So uh, thank you very much for following this uh, webinar. Thank you for all the great questions. And uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, we're going to leave on the note of um, uh, wishing you all the best of luck with your applications. It's an exciting time for you guys. And uh, we are here to you make uh, your dreams come true. So, uh, and and hopefully after that presentation, your dream is to go to study at the University of Glasgow. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for joining in, and I wish you all the best uh, luck.